Welcome everybody to Maine Small Mammals. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Welcome everybody to Maine Small Mammals. If you're joining us through Zoom, if you hover your mouse over the window, you'll see a control bar where you can press the question and answer or the chat buttons if you need to talk to us. Your cameras and your microphone are muted. And if you're watching through YouTube, please feel free to write a comment to us um, if you have a question to ask. We'll be getting started in about two minutes. And welcome everybody. We're going to get started now with Maine Small Mammals. We're so glad you could join us. We're gonna go now to Jade, who is down at Maine Wildlife Park in Gray. Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Jade and I'm an educator for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And today we're at the Maine Wildlife Park in Gray which is part of the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. 
Here at the park, we have a lot of different Maine native wildlife. We have bears, moose, owls, snakes, turtles, bobcats, beaver, and a lot more. They are here because they are injured, um, orphaned, or sometimes they were even illegal pets that are now human dependent, um, but all of them can no longer live in the wild on their own. So they're all non-releasable. And if you wanna learn more about the park, you can visit us at mainewildlifepark.com. So today we are going to talk about some small mammals in Maine. I'm sure most of you can name Maine's big iconic mammals, such as our moose, our black bear, the deer, fox, bobcat, lynx. But how many of the smaller mammals do you really know or can you name? A few of our small mammals include porcupines, different species of squirrels, like the red, um, gray flying and our Eastern chipmunks, woodchucks, striped skunk and opossum, raccoons, muskrats, different types of weasels like fisher, mink, marten, otter, and ermine. We have rabbits like the New England cottontail and snowshoe hare. We have little brown bats, star-nosed moles, meadow voles, white-footed mice, and there are more. And all these small mammals live in a variety of different habitats and are all an important part of the ecosystem. Some of them are predators and some of them are prey. Some of them are scavengers, which is nature's cleanup crew, but all of them play an important role in Maine's wild ecosystem. And we picked a few to talk about today. The first small mammal is the North American porcupine, which are the two that are here behind me. They just got their lunch and they've been coming and going from our view. So as we go today, we'll, we'll take a look at our porcupines. And the porcupine in Latin means quill pig. It's a very good name for them. They have large orange teeth. You can see in this top picture that they use for gnawing on branches. Those teeth are enriched with iron to help make them really strong. And they gnaw on branches and small plants for the food. And they are, of course, most known for the way that they protect them, the way they protect themselves. That's their quills. So they have more than 20,000 quills on their body. And that quill is a modified fur follicle. So I have here, this is shed regular porcupine fur. So this is the fur that covers their body and they shed this. They're shedding a lot right now because our weather's getting warmer. So they're shedding out that winter coat. And then these are the quills. And this is that modified hair. I hold just one. You have a porcupine behind you trying to show off. Oh yeah, that is the male porcupine here at the park. And you can see on his body, I don't know how detailed you can see on the camera, but some of his lighter hairs that are on his body are the quills and those dark brown ones are not his quills. And these are those quills, this is nice and close up. And they cannot throw these quills off of their body. You need to make contact with the porcupine for you to get poked with these quills or for another animal to get poked with the quills. So we see in cartoons or animations sometimes that they shoot them off of their bodies, but they cannot actually do that. That is a myth. And they lose and regrow these quills just like the other hair on their body. So they can lose them and then regrow them. They also have long claws, and those are for climbing trees and for grooming themselves. And they live throughout Maine, but they prefer hardwood um, forests with hemlock because it's one of their favorite foods. And this here is a piece of browse from the porcupines here at the wildlife park. And you can see how they use their teeth and they gnaw on it and they eat the bark off of it. They're also gonna eat the twigs and the leaves. So they eat just about all of it except for the really dense wood part in the middle. That's what they leave behind. So if you're walking through the forest, especially if it's one of those hardwood hemlock forests and you see this, it's a really good sign that there are probably porcupines up in the trees.
And another animal that has teeth for gnawing is the muskrat. A lot of people think that muskrats look like beavers because they live in the water and they're very good swimmers, but they're significantly smaller and they don't build dams or lodges. They make small burrows in the edge of the water on the embankments. And instead of using wood like a beaver, they use aquatic plants, usually cottontail, and that's what they build their little shelters out of. Here I have a beaver skull. And we can see these teeth again, very similar to the porcupine because they're doing that same, um, they have the same kind of diet. So they're gonna be eating browse and gnawing on wood. And the muskrat skull would look very similar to this beaver skull, just a lot smaller. So they have similar teeth because they do similar behaviors. And they're again, they're enriched with iron but muskrats will actually eat freshwater mussels as well. So beavers and porcupines are herbivores. They don't eat other animals, but muskrats will actually eat other animals. They'll eat freshwater mussels. This is a muskrat fur, and this is a full grown adult. So a lot smaller than a beaver, but very, very similar type of fur. So the top part of it here is that waterproof part because they're very aquatic, they're great swimmers. This is gonna help keep them waterproof and keep them um, warm. And then underneath is the fluffy down fur. So it's gonna be watertight so that this fluffy down fur can keep them warm when they're swimming around in Maine's chilly water. The next animal we'll talk about are weasels. So weasels have very long, slender bodies. Their bodies are very muscular for chasing down and catching prey. They have very sharp teeth and they can take down prey up to three times their own body size. So this here is a mink fur. And this gives a good example of what a weasel's body looks like. Very long, slender, and very strong, very muscular. So, and this is the mink. They're excellent swimmers. They live in wetland habitats and they're mostly nocturnal. And they're just one of the weasels that live here in Maine. So this first picture is of that mink. And another weasel in Maine are the pine marten and they are excellent tree climbers. This one's in the tree right there. We also have fisher and they're commonly called fisher cats but they are not related to felines at all and they do not eat fish. So kind of a bad name for them, but that's a fisher cat. And they're also really, really good climbers. They're gonna live up in the trees and they're actually one of the few animals that prey on porcupines. So we keep our fisher cat far away from our porcupines here at the park because we would never want that to happen to the porcupines. And another weasel is the river otter. They're the most aquatic of all the weasels and they live in social family groups. We also have ermine, they're a short-tailed weasel. These little weasels have to eat two thirds of their body weight each day and they change their fur for the seasons. So the one that's pictured here is brown and that would be their um, fall, spring and summer coat. And then in the winter, once the snow falls, they will turn solid white, except for a little black tip on their tail to help them camouflage and blend in. And if you want a more in-depth look at weasels, you can look at our Carnivores of Maine recording that we did previously, and we do um, a little bit more of a thorough overview of weasels in that one too. Another group of small mammals here in Maine are squirrels. So squirrels are rodents, and they include chipmunks, gray squirrels, red squirrels, flying squirrels, and even woodchucks. So some general adaptations for squirrels, they have fuzzy furry tails and they have orange iron enriched teeth for gnawing and eating as well. They use that tail for balance and they'll even use it as a rudder if they're trying to swim. And they scurry around and they eat mainly plants and they stash their food for saving for later. The first squirrel we'll, we'll look at is the red squirrel. 
So if you have been hiking in the woods in Maine, chances are one of these red squirrels has scolded you with its very sharp chatter for getting too close. They are a very noisy squirrel. They are active in the day. It means they're di diurnal. And they survive by storing or hiding their food. Pine seeds are one of their favorites. But red squirrels hide all their food in one spot so they know where to look for it. The gray squirrel that we'll talk about later hides it all over the place. So something that's a different behavior between red squirrels and gray squirrels. Flying squirrels are another squirrel that's here in Maine. And they cannot actually fly. They have these folds of skin that go along their sides of their bodies from their front arms to their back arms. And they can use those to glide from tree to tree. And these squirrels are strictly nocturnal. So they're very hard to see, but they might visit your bird feeders at night. So if you really want to catch a glimpse of a flying squirrel, you can check out your bird feeders at night. But again, they're strictly nocturnal, so you're not going to see them gliding around during the day. Next is our chipmunks, and they are a very small squirrel. They make that chip, chip, chip call that I sometimes think is a bird call, but it's actually the chipmunks. They are active during the day, and they don't hibernate in the winter. They actually move underground, and that's where they have all their food stored, but they stay active during the winter. Uh, they just go underground to keep their food safe and keep themselves a little bit warmer. Then the gray squirrel, so I mentioned before, they scatter their nuts all over the place and they can smell their way to their stash of food even under a foot of snow. So they have a very keen sense of smell and that's how they know where all their food is stored. And they are very abundant here at the wildlife park. We have a lot of oak trees and one of their favorite foods are acorns. So they are very popular here at the wildlife park. It's like a free range gray squirrel exhibit. I think the porcupines are a little jealous right now. So I think maybe we'll take a look at them. <laughs> yeah, so I think we can probably see, you can probably see both of them right now. The female porcupine is the one further back and the male porcupine is the one here in front. And it looks like he's trying to protect their lunch and doesn't want to share very much, but we do feed them in two separate piles. So there is a separate pile for her and a separate one for him. She was trying to steal some of his and he didn't like that. And they can quill each other. So they are pretty good at defending their food. They know just as well as other animals that they're very pokey. All right, where was I? Mm, gray squirrels. So gray squirrels, they can have two litters a year and each of those litters can have two to four babies. And then the squirrel that a lot of people might overlook are woodchucks. They're also known as groundhogs and they belong to a family of large ground squirrels called marmots. And they are a burrowing member of the squirrel family and they love to come above ground and wander looking for flowers, grasses and other plants to eat. They are a true hibernator. So in the winter, their body temperatures drop below 40 degrees for up to five to six months. So normally their body temperature, temperature is somewhere around 96, 97, but during those winter months for five or six months at a time, they will really, really drop their body temperature and they breathe a lot slower. So they are a true hibernator. And they're the Western marmot relatives are often called whistle pigs. And that's due to a loud whistling alarm call that they use to alert their colony and other animals. So they have all kinds of names, woodchucks, groundhogs, and whistle pigs. The next an small mammal that we'll talk about are little brown bat. And little brown bat here in Maine is endangered. They are the only mammal that can truly fly and they can catch and eat half their body weight in insects every night. They live in large colonies, and unfortunately this makes them, their populations very susceptible to disease, such as rabies, and right now it's the white nose syndrome that is hurting our little brown bat population. So more than 90% of the population has been lost here in Maine, and they are a very important species for managing insects. So we're doing some different things to try and help out these little brown bats. 
Another species that is endangered here in Maine are our New England cottontail. So the New England cottontail, there are, they're only found in a few areas of southern Maine. Maine is their most northern um, range of like limit to their range. So they're very hard to find and again, only in southern Maine. And it's believed that there are less than 300 of these um, New England cottontail in Maine. And then there's another species of cottontail, the Eastern cottontail. And this is a non-native species that was introduced and they hurt the native New England species. Um, the native species has shorter ears with black like around the edge of their ears and a smaller body and a black spot between their ears. And between that introduced species and habitat loss, the New England cottontail is endangered. So. A much more abundant species here in Maine is our snowshoe hare. And similar to the ermine, they can change their color for the season. So in the spring and summer, they're that nice brown color. And then in the winter, they turn white to help camouflage them with the snow. They can leap 12 feet in a single bound and run 30 miles per hour. So they're very agile and very quick. And they're one of the most important prey for Canada lynx. Another animal here in Maine is the striped skunk. This here is a striped skunk fur. And we can see these white stripes. And those white stripes stand out at night. And that is a warning for other animals to stay away. And those stand out at night. So striped skunks are a nocturnal animal. So they're only active in the nighttime. So that's why they have this coloration to help them stand out and give a warning side to other animals because as most of us probably know, skunks stink. So they have this musk and it's a, sul a sulfur alcohol compound and that is secreted from their anal glands. And skunks can spray multiple times in a row but it does take them time to refill if they have sprayed many times in a row. And one of their most common predators are great horned owls. I guess the great horned owls aren't bothered by that smell too much. Then the other fur I have here is a raccoon fur. And raccoons have this nice, very thick brown and black coat, the striped tail and that little black mask and they're very tactile animals so they rely on their sense of touch and they use their hands to feel for food in streams under logs and rocks and they'll really eat just about anything so here we can see those raccoon hands they're very similar to people hands <laughs> and they're going to use those for climbing and again for feeling around for food and that white raccoon is the raccoon that's here at the wildlife park. And he is albino. So he is completely lacking color pigment. So he doesn't have any of the gray and black colors like most raccoons. He doesn't have any color pigment in his eyes, on his skin, on his hair, no color pigment at all. He's completely albino. So we've talked about a lot of different types of mammals in Maine. Some are bigger and some are smaller. There's different carnivores and herbivores, but they all play a very important part and do their own different jobs in the ecosystems across Maine. The porcupines are here behind us again. They're really enjoying their lunch. And again, they're herbivores. So their lunch today was all different uh, zucchini, squash, lettuces, um, they got a couple carrots, some green beans. And we also have to give them browse so that like this that I showed you earlier, we have to keep them very well stocked on browse. In the wild, this would be the, the biggest part of their diet. So we have to keep lots and lots of hemlock in there for them to be munching on all the time. If you have any questions about any of the small mammals that we've talked about today, I would love to answer any questions that you have. So we have.
had a question about the browse actually. They were wondering why is the browse so important to the porcupine's diet? Yeah, so I talked about those teeth. I'm gonna use the beaver skull to talk about their teeth. So this is very similar to a porcupine. So I talked about those iron enriched teeth. So the way their teeth grow is the iron part in the front grows more slowly and the back teeth I, I'm, grows, sorry, wears down more slowly and the back wears down more quickly. Makes this kind of chiseled shape. So that's how they're gonna be eating that browse. But their teeth grow constantly. So it's really important for them to have that browse to keep their teeth healthy. If they didn't have brows, their teeth could actually grow into their bottom or top jaw because the, again, those teeth are growing all the time. So we need to make sure that they always have brows to be gnawing on to help file down and wear down their teeth so that their mouths don't have any injuries or they don't, um, they keep their teeth nice and healthy. Another question was about the snowshoe hair. Do they mate more than once a year? Just wondering because they were a favorite of mine. Yeah, I'm not sure um, about the snowshoe hare and how frequently they um, can have, uh, they can mate or have their babies. Um, I know most people say that bunnies and rabbits and hares do mate a lot. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did mate more than once a year, but I'm not positive. I know that we do have um, a lot of snowshoe hare in Maine, their population is doing very well. Um, so I don't think they're having any problems with um, mating and reproducing, um, but we'd have to look and see for sure how many times a year uh, the snowshoe hares do mate and reproduce because I'm not positive. Uh, another question we had was to, to uh, the brown bats eat mosquitoes and black flies. Yes. So they eat a lot of mosquitoes, which is something that I love about little brown bats. And they're going to eat just about any flying insect. Um, so they're active at night. And that's because they're not competing with other um, birds that are more active during the day. So they have kind of their own nocturnal habits. And they're going to eat any flying insects that they can, that they can get. And again, they're going to eat a lot. So they are a very small bat, um, but they can eat half their body size in insects each night. So even though they're small, the insects they're eating are significantly smaller. So they're eating a ton of mosquitoes and flies. All right, great. Um, and another question is, how do chipmunks get their cheeks so stuffed? <laughs> Yeah, so they have pouches in their cheeks just for carrying their food around. And there's some chipmunks that I've seen here at the park, and I can't believe that their food is not pouring out of their mouths because their heads look like they've doubled in size, all the food they can fit in there. So they have very stretchy, flexible skin on their cheeks, and it is so they can collect as much food as possible for storing for later. Um, and another question has to do with um, the night eye shine of animals. Um, what kind of animals would have a green eye shine at night? Yeah, I'm not sure about specific um, color of eye shine. I do know that certain animals have more than others. So one of the problems with one of our large mammals here in Maine, so the moose, they don't have an eye shine, whereas our white-tailed deer do have an eye shine. So especially driving at night, if you're driving through very uh, moose populated area, you want to be super careful driving at night because a deer in the headlights, as they say, is going to have that shiny eye that you can see um, and know there's a deer in the road. But moose don't have that. Um, and I don't know about specifically green. I know a lot of cats do have a greener eye. So maybe they do have a greener eye shine. So it could be a bobcat. Um, but a lot of nocturnal animals do have that. So raccoons will have an eye shine. Um, I'm not positive about fox, but I know raccoons do and our bobcats and our lynx will. Um, yeah. That's great. And another 
Another question somebody has is besides the garden veggies, what other things will the wood woodchuck eat? It's a great question. So we do know that the woodchucks can be a nuisance to gardeners. We're constantly trying to build things and protect our gardens from these guys because our tomatoes are just so tempting to them. They are full of sugar. But here at the park, they get very similar things, as I was saying, to the um, porcupine. So we give them brows. So like their name suggests, they do eat uh, brows. So they're going to strip just like this. They're going to eat the bark, twigs, and leaves off of the brows. And we supplement their food, too, with veggies, just like the porcupine. So they're going to get different leafy greens um, and things like squash and... Um, green beans, some carrots, cucumber, uh, not cucumbers. Uh, yeah, all kinds of veggies, celery. <laughs> we basically just get a big salad every day with brows. That's wonderful. And another question would be, speaking of the animals at the park, how many animals are there at the park? Yeah, so we have over 100 individual animals um, and over 30 different species of animals. So we have um, a lot of birds. So we have songbirds and raptors. We have some ground birds like turkeys. Um, then we also have larger animals like our black bears, um, mountain lion, Canada lynx, bobcats, moose, white-tailed deer, and in this area behind me is all these small mammals. So this is where our porcupine, fisher, beaver, woodchuck, and raccoon live. So we have a lot of different ones and we also have reptiles, um, turtles and snakes. So we really have just about every species of native Maine wildlife um, you can think of. And one more question, uh, just remind if you have questions, we'll be ending in about a minute. So please send us your questions. Um, but one more question that I have here is how far can a skunk shoot its spray? That is a really good question. So I don't know an exact, they can spray very far. Um, again, it's a defense mechanism that they have. So a skunk's first, before they spray, they do a foot stomping. So they're gonna stomp their feet they're gonna flash that white color, they're gonna like flash their tails and they're gonna turn that back end at whatever um, they are afraid of or whatever they think they're in danger of. So their first instinct is not immediately to spray, um, but when they do, they can spray several feet away from them. It comes out in like a stream. Um, and not only does it smell bad, but that, um, that compound can, really burn your eyes. It's of course not going to taste good. Um, so there's a lot of different components to that skunk spray that makes it especially unattractive for their predators. Yes, and just to add to that, um, so it can vary by different skunk to skunk, but it's usually somewhere around up to 10 to 15 feet. Yeah, so it's a pretty that good is distance. It, it is. <laughs> So that's it for our questions um, for today. If you have any more questions, please um, send them to us. Okay, those are really good questions. Um, thank you all for coming. I am gonna pick up the camera and move a little bit closer to the porcupine here, who is up on the log. Hopefully you can see her up there. She brought some of her lettuce, it looks like, and she's eating up on top of there. And again, this is the female. She's a little bit smaller and has less long white hairs on her body. And I loop around here. Oh, sorry, hold on to your seats. We're getting a little shaky here. I don't know if you can see him in the back. Maybe Laura, you can let me know if you can see the males sleeping in the sunshine. All right, now it's clear enough. You can see him a little bit. Is it possible to move your camera a little closer to the fence line? We see mostly fence right now. Oh, yeah.
when we say virtual tour, we really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the mailing here. All right, let's see. I think and I, there we go. We can see them. And this is a great example of why some of these animals are here at the wildlife park. He does not feel threatened because he is very used to people. They are very human dependent. So these porcupines were orphaned and a wild porcupine should never let anyone get this close. <laughs> And she's coming over to say goodbye too. So thank you all again for watching today. And on Thursday, we are having our bird adaptations talk. And if you want to go to um, mefishandwildlife.com, you can find different activities you can do from home and the other videos and virtual tours as well. So thank you all and have a great day. Thank you everybody. And we hope you'll uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And again, check us out at mainfishwildlife.com for more information about Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, as well as Maine Wildlife Park.